Okay, can I have the, the other five pillar of the society to come on board? So when, when Gary asked me to uh, do this, I, I was quite surprised that we have to do two complicated subjects, namely uh, AI and health in 25, 30 minutes. So, but I, I, we have a capable panel here. We'll do our best to, to try to touch on those. Before, and, and the way I would like to go about it to make it efficient is uh, introduce the panel first. And as part of that, I would like each panel member to say a little bit about AI and a little bit about health as to the, the, if, if their business is, is, does anything in those areas, etc., and introduce themselves. And then, we, 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 but when, then what I will do is have a quick uh, intro in each section. We do an AI-specific se section and a health-specific section. There will be overlaps, obviously, because AI is used in health. So uh, we can start from here, Mike. Uh, okay, uh, Mike Muller, I'm CTO and co-founder of Arm. I was also surprised to discover Cambridge isn't one of the emerging tech clusters in the, in the UK. Uh, maybe we've been absorbed by London. Uh, so Arm, we, uh, on AI, I guess there's three areas we play. Um, there's the classic hardware IP and software stacks to enable everything from microcontrollers with no hardware support through to dedicated accelerators um, for automotive or mobile phones. That's kind of one classic business. We have the other business, which is uh, cloud services business doing IoT and a data platform supporting consumer customer data platforms with billions of events a, a day being captured with a whole bunch of machine learning running on that. And I guess the third is as a consumer with a significant um, ML usage within ARM to make ourselves a more efficient business. And that's what I hope everyone in the room is doing, is actually looking at how they use ML within their own businesses. With respect to healthcare, I have um, high expectations of this panel because the last panel I was on on healthcare uh, ended up with this bizarre selfie with me, Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam, <laughs> my wife on one side and Katy Perry on the other. <laughs> so uh, um, that was a fairly diverse healthcare panel. Uh, and I guess on healthcare for me, it's the extremes that of th the stuff I've seen in um, electronics implanted in the brain through to you know self-actuation of um, muscles for people with spinal fractures uh, and I can give an example later of my kind of favorite machine learning meets uh, healthcare example but we'll get to that Great. thank you Hi. thanks for having me here I'm Manjiri Chandran Ramesh uh, and I'm part of the investment team at IP group PLC we are a FTSE 250 constituent um, and we do cradle to maturity. So we take um, early stage from the university, create academic uh, with no team, prototype and commercialize it. And some of our biggest assets are um, First Light Fusion, Oxford Nanopore, um, Ultra Haptics is getting there very soon. <laughs> um, within the um, IP group investment teams, we've got a life sciences team and a technology team. Um, Life Sciences invests in healthcare and biotechnology, and there is a lot of AI that, that's uh, part of that uh, set of assets. Um, I sit within the technology team, and we have a lot of assets that, have, uh, that apply machine learning from uh, fintech and data management to data centers. Uh, my own background is a PhD in uh, machine learning and robotics from Oxford, so I manage a vast portfolio of the software assets. Uh, so, Paul Dorry, I'm the chairman of the IIT Security Foundation. Uh, I'm also a, a visiting professor in cybersecurity at Royal Holloway University of London. So, I'm a cybersecurity guy, and I'm pleased to say, Alan, I started in financial services and I actually moved into other sectors. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I've, I've been trying to count them about 12, I think. So, uh, so what do cybersecurity people think about AI? Um, we, we actually see it in three different ways. First of all, we're finding there are AI systems that help us identify stuff. 
So they're actually helping us look at attacks and look at um, insider behaviours and things. And, and that's proven to be really good. The second thing we think we're seeing, because they don't tell us about it, is what the bad guys are doing with AI. But as far as we can tell, we're starting to see things being more automated, things getting more clever and, f and faster, including uh, some of this sort of attempting to manipulate people through social engineering that looks like it's automated. Uh, so the bad guys are learning AI as fast as we're learning AI. Um, the third way we look at AI is actually AI as a victim. So what can you do to AI to manipulate it in a way that you get the results that the, that the owner of the system does not want? And what can you do to its data uh, such that, that that data could be jeopardized and stolen? So that's quite fundamental. So whether it's Microsoft with their Twitter bot um, back in 2016 where Tay became both racist and foul-mouthed, uh, by people manipulating the, the inputs, but other, perhaps you could poison data inputs as well in AI. Um, in terms of, um, of medical, um, actually my, my PhD is neurophysiology, so um, I'm, I'm one of these hybrids that perhaps bridge, bridge across things. I spent some time uh, at the Royal Society of Medicine a few weeks ago talking to clinicians and, uh, and to consultants, and you know what they say about innovation? They love it, but they're scared of it. And they're, they're really frightened that the black box inside the innovation could prove to be unreliable uh, and actually that, that makes them scared. Elena? Hi, so I'm Elana Wisby. I'm the Chief Executive of Oxford Quantum Circuits. We are a quantum computing company, so we're building quantum hardware. We're a spin-out from Oxford University and um, both AI and healthcare are end-user markets that we'd be looking at within the next five to ten years. So in the future, you'd be able to do AI and machine learning on a quantum computer. This way you'd be able to optimize um, not just across a small subset of values, but across many, many, many variables, making it incredibly more powerful. You could also get great speed up with your algorithms. And within healthcare, this is the one that I find particularly exciting, you might be able to um, in envisage, instead of having pharmaceutical companies doing processes experimentally, <coughs> doing them on a quantum computer through molecular simulation. And that's actually a near-term application for quantum computing. So that will be within the next five to six years that we should be starting to see that have impact. Mike, Michael. Uh, I'm Mike Denham. I'm the CEO of Mindtrace, uh, which uh, Hussain kindly introduced as part of his presentation. Um, my background is uh, 40 plus years as an academic researcher. Uh, I'm a emeritus professor at the University of Plymouth at the moment. And um, what I've been studying is uh, how the brain processes information. And we ha all have a very good uh, example here of the most efficient information processing system that exists, um, using 20 watts of energy to process an amazing amount of information. And I've been studying that for many years. And uh, in the last few years, I realized that with the advent of very powerful many core computer systems that we were capable probably of developing new algorithms which modeled the way in which the brain processes information and to deploy those algorithms on very efficient low energy hardware systems. And that's what Mindtrace is attempting to do. We believe we have the algorithms. We're looking at prototype hardware at the moment, which is uh, emerging from the EU program in uh, the Human Brain Project. And uh, we are building those algorithms to meet a number of uh, applications, which we believe have the requirements which current machine learning algorithms don't provide. So as Hussein mentioned, uh, the learning which currently goes on is requiring very, very large data sets. There was an enormous uh, step forward in reducing error rates in machine learning, in speech technology, in image recognition technology in 2012, 13, with Google Brain. But they had access to huge amounts of data and a huge amount of computing power. We believe that uh, we can, by modeling the brain and modeling the way in which the brain processes information, we can get to the stage where we can develop learning algorithms which mimic the two-year-old child 
who sees a cat for the first time is told it's a cat, next time it sees a cat, cat. And that's what we call one-shot learning. And we believe that that's possible, and it will be very disruptive, and there are a massive number of applications out there uh, for that type of technology. Thank you, Michael. So um, I'm just going to make a, a, a quick comment and pose put the first question to panelists. Everyone has promised me to be controversial and brief. So, um, so, 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 you know, uh, if you look at AI, uh, many people see it as the main driver for the fourth industrial revolution. You know, I, I have uh, many people, including. Um, esteemed people in the government telling me that is the case. Uh, as far as investment is concerned, you know, in 2016, there was over 25 billion invested in AI. For your information, it, I think last year was north of 50 billion. So money is going into AI in a very, very big way. And, and if you look at AI, um, there's two aspects to it. There's the underlying technology, uh, uh, because it's a really New, um, new tech, really. I mean, uh, uh, compared to um, the, the time it will take to develop, um, you know, advances that are needed. So it's very new and it, it's, it's developing. Um, and on the other hand, there are uh, application or deployment of AI. So there are two different things: developing the core technology and uh, and, and de ap um, deploying it in in, in specific application. Some people uh, will, I, I know someone said uh, it's AI is this miraculous thing that no one seems to know about what it is, or is it really new wisdom that will change everything? W w with that background, I would like to put the first question to the panel. Um, is AI as important as disruptive as the investment levels and bandwagon trends suggest, or are we going to be disappointed? Or will the impact be much more than we can imagine? Right. Uh, well, I, 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 I guess it is the next big thing, and an awful lot of the investments will be very disappointing. Um, and I think it's that balance, as you said, between people developing technology and actually delivering applications. And there's a big bubble of people coming up with AI solutions, and it's a bit like the early days of the web. You say it's AI, and nobody really looks at what that means, and they'll invest in it. Um, I think it's a 10-year, 15-year play to be transformational in how lots of people embed machine learning into how they run their businesses. Um, an awful lot of the investment in AI startups will come to nothing. Can I, can I ask you a question? Sorry. And, and everyone, please make a comment about the second question, because I just thought of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a very good question, I think. Uh, you know, w one of the technologies that came a few years ago, or enabling, was internet, you know. And we had internet companies, we had all sorts of weirdo companies starting, etc. I sort of almost see the same deja vu thing, except that this is high tech. Do you think AI would be bigger than internet, or smaller than internet? I think its impact will be much less apparent because it will change the way people deliver the services, but I'm not sure it's going to be as transformational in what you consume as a consumer. It'll just change the way that those services are being delivered. Thank you. Yeah. So if, if, if you look at the history of, of AI, we've already been through, I would say, a couple of hype cycles on, on the Gartner curve. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think this is, you know, e even past the, I would say this is the third, uh, you know, fourth hype cycle rather than we've crossed the valley of, of death and, you know, we, we are now at, at the golden age. Um, so it, I agree with you, you know, it, it, we are going to find a lot of disappointing uh, investments, a lot of disappointing uh, companies. The other thing, you know, I would comment on is I don't think, you know, overnight we're going to find AI is literally, you know, change the world. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be a very gradual but sure change that, you know, over a decade or over 15 years, we'll suddenly realize that AI is so ubiquitous, we haven't even realized it's affecting us. It, it's already happening, you know. You, you pick up your phone, um, and for instance, you know, every Saturday I, I tend to take my children to uh, piano lessons. Um, it now tells me traffic is, is kind of heavy. You might want to leave now. 
How did, how did the phone know? I, I didn't program anything. It just recorded the fact that I was going every Saturday. And that to you is, is, is a small nugget of AI, but it's that sort of incremental steps that we're going to see over the next decade or 15 years. So to, to answer your you know, this last question, uh, I think it is going to be transformational. It's just not going to have the same level of impact yeah. because people are just going to sort of accept it in their lives. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I think the Gartner hype curve was aimed at technologists. When, when it's non-technologists, it's worse. So um, the, the, there's a Dilbert cartoon I remember during the early internet days where the pointed head boss said, can you make it more webbish? <laughs> and, uh, and now we're seeing, um, it can't be a strategy. You haven't mentioned AI or, AI or blockchain in what you've just said. Um, and the problem is it's this black box thinking, which is that, you know, now let's sprinkle AI on it and therefore it's okay, it's a strategy. And so getting past that, and what worries me, and again, particularly as a security professional, if you, if you adopt a black box and you don't bother to try and understand it, that they're gonna have you. Because those people who will understand it will manipulate it. Um, and those who don't understand it may even use it in a bad way and cause problems. What I think will happen is, a bit like you know, the early days of internet, when frankly I use Gopher, um, which is a great way of finding files, but not a very exciting experience. I wouldn't have thought of shopping on Amazon at the time or watching YouTube movies, but it was transformational when that happened. And I think we'll see that with AI. It'll, it'll start with some very specific use cases, it's perhaps around certain image recognition and things, and perhaps some medical applications where we're going, that is superb what you can just do for me there. And then slowly the things will start to grow and we'll be very surprised. Anyone else? Yeah, so I should mention that my previous position was COO at a software development company that was focused on AI and bot technology, and that the most money we made was through um, initially purchasing a whole load of domains of names.ai, and th they became very popular very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, I do have some, some background in the area, and I think that um, one of the most interesting things with the, the kind of high impact AI applications are very focused and they are very specialist mm. and therefore they are the ones that take a longer time to come through to fruition. So I, I feel that you get a lot of the consumer focused or like slight enhancement um, applications coming early on and that's where the hype goes up and down but I think the high impact stuff is more hidden from the end user um, but that's the stuff that I would get really excited about. All, all the people with a five-year investment horizon are going to see their money lost. Am I right? Not everyone. Oh, so sorry, I'm just trying to be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. oh, Michael, okay. Um, I think one of the things we have to understand is AI is not new. AI has been around for at least uh, 50 years. Um, you know, Marvin Minsky and so on. And then we had the AI winter. Um, and uh, I was ar around at that time. I mean, I was in funding council and saying, you know, we shouldn't put money into AI because it's dead. Um, and then it sort of revived again, you know, when machine learning came on. But is machine learning AI? I mean, I, I'm not sure it is. Um, we're not actually clear about whether that's developing intelligence at all. Um, there was a very recent paper published which showed that if you stick a few stickers which look like graffiti on a stop sign and then show it to one of the current machine learning tools which is being used by <coughs> Waymo for doing autonomous driving, it will, res it will see that stop sign as a yield sign. You'll see it's something completely there. They'll just completely misclassify it. And that's just putting a few little stickers. So someone said recently, one, one of the things we have to be careful about with AI that's being deployed now, it's actually remarkably stupid. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's something we have to be aware of with this hype curve, that what are we talking about, first of all, with AI? Is, is machine learning AI? It's very narrow. AI, if it is AI, uh, it's very difficult to transfer information from one domain to the other reliably. It's very fragile. Um, and uh, I think that uh, AI itself, if we truly understand what we mean by intelligence, and we can actually develop that in machines, I think it has a huge potential. In areas like healthcare, for instance, 
But would you trust a healthcare system based upon current machine learning, which you know is potentially going to be in a failure mode? I mean, how many people are turning off their, their ADAS systems in their high-end uh, high cars at the moment because they're actually misclassifying data? And I think we have to be very careful about what we do and what we say about AI now. Because if we start deploying it, I, I know of particular situations, for instance, in US hospitals where they've been deploying so-called AI systems to recognize sepsis uh, in patients, which as everyone knows is a killer, if unless it's treated quickly. And the, the clinical staff are turning off those systems within the first few weeks of use, simply because they're doing too much false alarms. There's too much misclassification. And it's just making their life a nightmare. So we have to be careful what we call AI, what is recognized as narrow machine learning. And in some cases, that narrow machine learning is very powerful. It's, it's transformed speech recognition technology, for instance. But let's be careful about what we call AI. Thank you, Marco. I think it, it, it seems from the discussion we, we agree that uh, AI or machine learning is transformative, but it's going to take some time and exactly which bit of it would work when, you know, it, it is yet to develop. Now, if I could change the question to a uh, very UK-centric question. In your opinion, what you think would make UK efforts in AI successful? And if you could suggest, you know, the blocking issues or strength that UK has would be really helpful. Uh, oh, I'll go first again. Uh, um, I, I guess the biggest blocker for me is that people think it's anything special and it's hard um, and that you need to go and employ experts. So take machine learning as a tool. It, um, I had a guy in arm who thought, I spend all my life doing validation work. It's boring and repetitive. I do the difficult bit, which is dreaming up what tests we should run, and then it's compute heavy to go run, run those tests. No machine learning, no AI background whatsoever. You go to Google, you get free tools. I think that's what really has changed is, here's a complete development, free tools. I know all about verification. I'll start playing with some algorithms to see if I can do a machine learning algorithm to pick better tests than I can. Mm. And in six months, he's taken about 30% of our compute power out of our cluster doing verification. One guy, no compute, no, no machine learning expertise. We're now deploying it across all of our CPU developments. And, you know, for me, that 20%, that 30% CPU compute saving, mm -hmm. it's transformational. One person didn't need to go and hire data scientists, didn't need to go and find specialists. And that's where I think it can, you, you can do great things with this really crude basic tool, run it forward 15 years and it's something completely different. So people can start <coughs> using machine learning today in what they do. It doesn't have to be some glorious academic project that creates wonderful new things. It's out there, just go and use it. So is there, does, in the UK, do we have to do anything specific? Do we have to worry about? Do we have to prepare? Do we have... What, what, no, I mean, I think you have to invest across the spectrum because you have to invest in academics and you have to drive forward what the, the, the leading edge looks like. But there's also the bit that, that our community is probably small enough that you can actually get the message across that's just go out there and do things. Thank you. Hi. Following the same thing, same yeah. pattern? Okay. You want to go in sequence or you want to jump around? No, it's fine. We can okay, um, over it. So the biggest thing I see from, from the investment side of things is, you know, as, as it was alluded to earlier, is to sprinkle this, this buzzword into pretty much everything, whether, whether you even do you know, a smattering of machine learning or not, everybody wants to put that in their pitch deck just because it's a buzzword, just because they feel the investor will look at it and they will sign the check. Uh, and it's, it's really sifting through all of that noise to pick up the ones that are truly doing the disruptive uh, technology, that are truly doing the innovative uh, technology. So I, I don't think there is anything blocking the UK in, in progressing forward, but uh, unfortunately the UK is also following the uh, models from, from other parts of the world 
where let's just use buzzwords and, and try and get away with it. Thank you, Paul. So, data worries me because it's the fuel that these machine learning systems need to, to, to fuel them. And, and I think what we've seen with Facebook and others that there can be an undercurrent lashback against the way data could be used. And I think the, what the UK needs to do is, is actually face that head on and say, we need to create a way of, of data and the way data is being used, being done in a trustworthy manner, um, ethically applied, and try and apply a higher bar. I, I think the alternatives, if you look at the standard regulation, is you know, would GDPR mean that you couldn't hold anything to do with people, um, or you could opt out? Now, that could create biased data sets, which could then be fed into AI systems that would create biased answers that could then be applied to society inappropriately. So I really think we need to look at some fundamental ethical things and not, not be frightened that ethics is what you apply afterwards, but you actually apply it up front mm. as an enabler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think data pooling is really important because obviously you need to make sure you have good data as a start point. Equally, there's a huge amount, and this is my bias here, coming out from universities and actually uh, for the UK to be supporting that uh, transfer of knowledge from universities um, through the, the process is something which I think we could do with a lot more of. Um, one of the projects I'd previously worked at um, on at my last company was um, working with the University of Surrey. We had um, a diabetic retinopathy um, diagnosis tool using machine learning um, that was developed within the university. And by the time we won an Innovate UK fund funding proposal to create the platform and to try and uh, enable the distribution of this uh, within remote communities in India. Um, and unfortunately, by the time that process has come through, um, Google had like beaten us to it. <laughs> and it was really soul destroying for the researcher. But again, it just wasn't quite quick enough off the mark in taking that tech, um, the potential of that from an early stage within the university and bringing it out to accelerate it. Michael? I think that uh, one of the biggest stumbling blocks to the use of uh, artificial intelligence, or I should say machine learning, is uh, the fact that it's very much a black box uh, technology at the moment and, and therefore uh, generating confidence and trust in the use of machine learning is, is a major stumbling block, I think, um, that we have to face. Um, and the more we can actually understand and explain what's actually going on in that black box, I think uh, would help that process enormously. And the other aspect, of course, is, uh, you know, coming from my point of view, is that um, the uh, intelligence which machine learning is, is embedding is very narrow. And, um, uh, and, and therefore, one of the things which we need to understand also is, is how to expand that to include things like context and, and so on, which helps to, you to understand what's in the black box, because you, you're not just sort of looking at a specific bit of data, but you're looking at the context of that data as well and trying to understand how that plays into the intelligence uh, of the, of the uh, product. The other thing which I think is a, a major problem which we have is, uh, is mentioned many, by many previous speakers, and that is the access to, uh, to the talent that we need to actually develop artificial intelligence in the UK. And that's the thing that worries me. We, we, uh, we built out in, in Manchester. We have uh, some very good universities around us. And uh, we have recruited, uh, we, we are 10 people uh, at the moment in the company. We have um, uh, seven of those people are, are PhDs. Um, they're all with first class honours degrees in either maths or um, uh, computer science or artificial intelligence. And uh, they are Polish, Lithuanian, uh, uh, Serbian, Italian. And, and if we cut that off, I don't know what's going to happen. Because they're all people also have been educated in the UK. They're not people who come from the universities in Serbia or whatever. I mean, the Serbian guy um, did his um, did his sixth form work in Eton. Uh, he did his first degree at Imperial, and his PhD at Cambridge. Now, uh, you know, the, but is that going to be available in the future? I don't know. 
Thank you, Michael. I think what I will do, I was going to have one more question on AI. We'll combine it to the next section. I want to jump to health for a minute, if I could. Um, let's just make just a, a little bit of comment, because I, I, I happen to have some history trying to do stuff in health. Um, and I have to say, I only like to make two comments. One is, uh, you know, the UK is unique. You know, we have NHS here. And my view of life is if a company or a country has a competitive advantage, it better use it. But despite every effort in the last 10 years or so, I have not been able to successfully engage with NHS. We can, we can talk about the details, but that has to change. I'll be interested to, to hear. In fact, I was talking uh, earlier, uh, I think uh, uh, Marjorie told me that uh, something which I will steal and, and, and repeat. Uh, because the previous thing with, with my companies, I discovered you end up doing pilots after pilots after pilots. And Andrew pointed out to me, there is a saying that they say NHS has more pilots than RAF, <laughs> so, which I thought is, is, is a very, very good, uh, good statement. You can make a comment both about the, the, the sector and also what, what the government or health have to do to make it happen. But just your, your view, either your company or your personal one, doesn't really matter. I'm really interested to hear the views. Okay, so I guess um, by getting out of the way is the simple answer. Um, so my favourite current AI healthcare product, um, ha ha how to help with um, heart disease, turns out one of the major issues is people don't take their medication. medication and one of the best ways you can tell with these particular medications, whether you've taken it, involves you sticking a box on the wall best in the bathroom because it's best if you're not wearing any clothes uh, and it's a bunch of cameras and it looks at your ankles and swelling of the ankles is um, a great way of predicting whether you're on the right medication at the right strength and uh, it's really simple and why I really like it is when you look at the product and you take the lid off you open it up and inside it's a bunch of mobile phone cameras joined to uh, Raspberry Pis connected with a Linksys hub uh, and a uh, GSM phone module. So it's all kind of off the shelf technology glued together by yeah. researchers in the NHS who then write a small amount of code as your AI algorithms to learn what normal ankles look like running in the cloud. Doesn't need tech entrepreneurs in the way. It's getting enough tools into the hands of people who know what they do. And it's back to my point about keeping it simple. The tools now are there that other people can go and do the healthcare. Doesn't need the wacky science end. Doesn't need a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. There's another case, there's a whole bunch of other ones where that's what it is. It's deep science. You're doing neural implants and, uh, and muscle stimulation. Completely different level of technology. But again, you keep it simple. You can just let people get off and use the tools. But do you think that would happen automatically within, it's within the NHS? Or it's within happening. No, it, it's yeah. happening. It's happening. Okay. Yeah. Right. On to you. Right. So uh, we do have a lot of discussions. As I said, I, I am part of the technology team uh, and I uh, have a lot of discussions with my counterparts in the life sciences uh, team. Um, and it's it's quite amusing that you know we, we discuss about how to sell to the defense department or, or an aerospace company and how difficult it can be to actually sell to these people, how we need to absolutely identify a particular use case, make that value proposition, uh, and then find all of those budget holders because there are so many stakeholders. Uh, and my healthcare colleague went, but that's exactly the same here. Uh, it's just you know getting the tech companies to understand instead of trying to boil the ocean focus on that one use case, as you said, you know, with, with the ankles. There's so many different uh, diseases that, that they could monitor, but they have identified that this is their sweet spot. So focusing on that use case to actually make a difference. But equally with the NHS, uh, I'm, I'm told that, you know, there are multiple, multiple stakeholders, which makes it just so difficult to progress a, a product. And so, you know, maybe the government can do something to, to centralize, you know, such decisions such that it doesn't become so difficult. Thank you, Paul. I think we need to lift, help them lift their own capability to be able to adopt and manage technology. If you think of simple stuff like, like WannaCry, that affected uh, 80 um, hospital trusts, but uh, almost 600 GP surgeries. Um, and people didn't have the expertise to deal with it 
or, 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 or it wasn't part of their, their capability agenda. When I talked to these clinicians uh, at the uh, uh, Royal Society of Medicine, they actually wanted things to be regulated. And they actually said, can you, t can you take the, the MHRA with you along in technology? Uh, because if you look at the Federal Drug Administration, there's actually a lot more vocal about appropriate delivery of technology into a medical environment. And, and they said they'd get more confident if their, if their infrastructures and their ecosystems were more able to handle technology, whether it's you know, just managing the network right so it's secure, or if it's their, that their regulator says, look, I'm up for some of this stuff and, and I can help set the scene for you. Thank you. Elena? Yeah, I think it's been touched on a little bit, but the minute the NHS is structured in such a trust-by-trust trust basis, so uh, within... Um, other Oxford Univer University spin-outs, for example, Ultromics, um, they have a um, heart, di uh, I think they can diagnose cardiovascular disease based on uh, valves, like to a much greater uh, degree of accuracy than a doctor can through the scan. Um, and they've had to go out to a number of trusts individually and get singular signatures from the CEO and the departments in order to, to run these trials. Whereas actually there is a centralised system that comes up at the top, but accessing that is very, very challenging. So at the minute you have to go individually to 130 bodies to run all of these trials. So that's obviously a huge hindrance. Equally with the data pooling is a very similar, um, similar problem. Uh, though I believe that is something they are now, um, there is an initiative, I think 60 million or something into anonymising and data pooling some of the NHS's data. Um, but equally, you don't want that to be going directly into commercial hands. So partnering, for example, with universities who can look at that anonymised data um, and run all the initial processing, but then have the IP of the output of that go into a commercial entity that doesn't then have uh, direct access to all of the details of the sensitive data is a model which is proving quite um, fruitful. Um, when we first started talking to investors about our company, we mentioned healthcare as one of the possible application sectors, and we were immediately warned off, don't go there, um, because of the problems, the regulatory problems, the trials problems, and, and so on and so forth. It's just too difficult. Um, I've talked to individual clinicians, and they're very anxious to try and get that technology on board, but uh, they also say the same, um, it's not going to be possible. <laughs> um, and it's the, the, the feedback we were getting as well wasn't just in the UK, it was in the United States as well from investors there. So it's a problem which is sort of endemic. It's not, um, it's not just the NHS. I think it's a real problem of getting these type of, uh, this type of technology into, uh, into healthcare. But I think the potential <coughs> is huge. I mean, the potential for wearable diagnostics and, and so on, I think, is massive and will come. But it needs a different structure to understand how we can actually get that uh, technology into the healthcare industry. Thank you, Michael. My, by the way, my experience is US is a little bit easier. It still takes a long time mm. because the insurance companies are involved and they, if they can see the return on investment, you, you have a chance. Um, uh, we... we um, only uh, we want to really wrap up. I have one more question, um, and my question to everyone is: uh, What is their view about the ethics, transparency, and security, both for AI or health? In fact, some of it is common, but I, I would be interested. You know, what do you think about that subject? You know, it's pretty complicated, of course, but is is there regulatory requirements? Should we m move on it first, or? just wait, you know, the industry sort this out and, and, and all issues are resolved. And any views? Uh, enormous topic. Not sure we have time to do it <laughs> any justice whatsoever. But I think quick it, answer. It's all of the things, and you include data, integrity, trust, all of those things. I think the diff, for me, is it regulatory? Yes, there's all manner of things. I think the, the, the important change is 
on what we try to do is push all the way back to junior designers that they have a responsibility to think about what they're doing yeah. in a way that I never had to do when I was a, a, a hardware designer, whereas now you have to push it right the way down the chain to the beginning. It is not something you can add as a compliance Absolutely. test yeah. at the end. It's about how you fundamentally approach design from the bottom up. Okay, That's thank it. you. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, it, it, is, it is a huge topic in itself, but you absolutely cannot retrospectively uh, apply this. This has to happen right now as the technology is being uh, developed. And, you know, you, there, there are many schools of thought as to wh whether you, you just literally try and articulate every scenario and, and hard code the, the ethics behind it. Uh, or do you indeed, you know, sort of work out what the vast majority of of humans might do, you know, and, and work, work towards that. There is no right answer, but at least we should be working on it right now. Many of the business sectors I speak to are very surprised when I suggest they have an ethics committee because they've not had to do that before. They're, they're not in biomedical or, or, or things where they've come across those sort of challenges. Um, and in fact, they, they'd rather say, are we compliant? And say, no, no, you need to get your head around this and understand the implication of what, what you're about to do mm -hmm. and make decisions. And perhaps the right answer is no, we won't do this because of what it could imply. But actually, I think the creation of, of ethics committees and those conversations in companies that have never seen it before in their lives is something really key. Thank you. Lina? Yeah, I don't have so much to add, except I might be taking on an ethics committee for my quantum computing in the future <laughs> also. <laughs> I think uh, ethics uh, and the ethical uh, aspects of AI is very important and, and we should address it very carefully. Uh, however, I don't think it's uh, uh, that much more of a problem than we've had to address with other technologies in the past. Um, I mean, everything that we've done in technology has had good applications, which have saved lives, saved the planet, whatever, and have bad applications. and. Uh, I like someone's point of view the other day. I heard someone said, we shouldn't be afraid of artificial intelligence. We should be more afraid of real stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think that uh, we should embrace the technology, but we should be careful how it's used. But we all face the same problems that we face with all technology. It comes down to the way that politicians think about how this technology should be deployed. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to thank you all, but I, just uh, I, I wrote a few comments here, having listened to, to exchanges here. I think on a, AI, the conclusion I got from this discussion that it's certainly transformational, uh, but it's going to take some time. And specifically, we need to be careful about two things. One is the expectation or reputation in the process that as we do this and make sure is understood correctly. And secondly, the data is important and requires some rules and, and, and you know, disciplines around the way uh, it's handled. Otherwise, you know, the, 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 um, uh, you, you said people get scared and they don't <laughs> trust the technology, we're going to have a problem with that. I think we also highlighted the issue of talent, which has come out all day today. Um, and I heard very strongly from Michael that he was saying no Brexit there, but I, <laughs> I, I, I won't put it in his mouth, but I think that's, which I agree, by the way. <laughs> I, I was determined to put Brexit somewhere in here. Um, and uh, I think on health, um, uh, I, I think there's clear indication uh, that it would be good to have better working with NHS, but also, I hadn't thought about it, but Mike said, it would be get to get the, 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 the entrepreneurial takers out of the way, make sure simple things happen. And actually, when I think about that, there's an element of truth in that. It's because there are simple tasks that everything is in place for it to happen. It just needs to happen. Um, I hope you, you found the discussion useful. I did indeed. And thank you very much for the five pillars again. Um, thank you again. <laughs>